Welcome back to the band guide where we use garage band to create professional sounding music. I'm your band guy, Colin, and today is the eighth video in the Ultimate Garage Band Beginner's Guide. This series is walking through everything you need to know from the very first time you open up Garage Band until you're exporting out your finished, mixed, and mastered song. In fact, we're actually going to be recording, mixing, and mastering a song throughout this series as well. So stick around for that. Right now we're going through everything you need to understand inside GarageBand to feel comfortable and confident using it to create your own music, which is what this is all about, right? It's how to make your music inside GarageBand. And speaking of that, I wanna give you something to help you feel more comfortable creating music in GarageBand. It's called the Ultimate GarageBand Guide. This is a downloadable guide that you can look back on and reference anytime you're working on your music. It has everything from the gear you need, mixing, mastering, recording, all the shortcuts, everything you could think of inside GarageBand completely free from the link in the description below. So be sure to pick it up. It's really gonna help you out. But let's go and get into today's video where we're talking about what's called signal flow, which is how sound is moving around inside GarageBand. And this is really important important because you are going to be recording audio and then affecting it, processing it to fit together, to sound good, to sound clean and clear and professional. And understanding how it's moving around behind the scenes in GarageBand is really, really important. The fact is you can't actually see it. You just have to know how it's moving around inside GarageBand. So this is really, really helpful. So if we look at our tracks that we have laid out here, you'll see that we have three kinds of tracks. We have our drummer track, we have a software instrument track, also called a MIDI track, and then we have our audio tracks. Now, this is the first place where there's a little bit of difference in how sound moves. So here we have an audio recording of something that happened in the real world. And this is the sound that we're going to hear and then process. But with our MIDI track and our drummer track, neither of those actually create sound in and of themselves. They create sound through a virtual instrument. So if we hit B to bring up our smart control window, if you have the drum drummer selected, you'll see here that there's a drum kit plugin right here. That's a virtual instrument that's actually creating that sound. So if you have a third party drum kit plugin that you wanna use, you could actually change that out here. Same thing with this organ right here. This MIDI information is telling this organ plugin that's titled B3 what to play for the sound that we're going to hear, right? After those plugins, so after the drum kit plugin or this B3 or whatever, if you're using a bass or a synth or anything like that, functionally, after that, it's the same as if you'd recorded it in the real world. You're gonna process it the exact same way. So even though these look really, really different, once you get past this little plugin right here, you can pretend like you just recorded that audio out in the real world as if it's an audio track. It's fundamentally the same. So important first note. So. Once we have our sound, and we're just gonna talk about these regions as if they're all exactly the same. Once we have our sound, it's then gonna travel down through a series of plugins that's going to affect that sound. So, uh, for example, this is a guitar track, so it's running through a guitar amp sound. And these run from top to bottom in this list, right? And then after the plugins, then they go to our volume fader right here on that track and then to the pan position. So here, I could turn this track up with this volume fader, or I could pan it off to one side or off to the other side, right? So I have control over where things are laid out uh, in volume and in pan left to right, and I can do that for any of these tracks. So we go from the audio down through the plugins to process the sound, from top to bottom, and then through the volume fader, and then to the pan position. And then after that, it actually hits something that we can't even see right now. But if you hold Command, Shift, and M, it will bring it up down here. This is the master track. So the master track is actually one place where you can process your entire song, all the audio from your song, in one single place. So if I click on this track here, and hit B to bring up our smart control window, you'll see that we have plugins over here again, and we can actually process that sound a little bit more. So if I wanna take my entire song, let me open up this EQ here, and make it sound really lo-fi, I could put these filters on it and just filter it out like a really lo-fi sounding song, right? So the entire song is gonna go through this one place, which makes it really powerful to do just a little bit of mixing. So when it comes time to mix, which we'll be talking about here in a few videos after we record our song, we can do a lot of subtle changes here on the master track that will really enhance the entire song. So one note about this, even though you can't see it right off the bat, you can hold Shift, Command, and M to show it. 
but you can also always access it if you hit B to bring up a smart control window. I can always get to those plugins by clicking over here to master, which is really important. So when you're on track, you're looking at the individual track. And then when you're on master, you're looking at that master track that the entire song is running together. So even if I'm on the drummer track here, if I have master selected, any processing I'm doing right here is on the entire mix, not on the drummer specifically. So you need to stay on track to stay on that drummer specifically. Hope that makes sense. Okay, so then after the master track, it will go through this volume fader. After the plugins, it goes through the volume fader and then the pan knob on the master track. I never pan on the master track, but I guess you could. And then it finally goes to this little volume fader up in the top right corner. Now, if you saw my video yesterday, I mentioned that you want to keep this set at zero. Same with this master track. Just set these to zero and don't think about them. Don't worry about them. The truth is you just want those to not add or take away volume. That's the way you mix. You just pull it up to neutral so it's not adding or taking away volume. And then if you need your song to sound louder as you're working on it, you have a volume output on your interface and you or on just your laptop. So you can turn up or down on your output on your laptop, on your interface to hear it louder or quieter. And then when it's time to actually make it loud, that's the mastering process that we're gonna talk about at the end of this series. So don't worry about the fact that your song is quiet right now because it is. As long as you can hear it well enough, then don't worry about it. Okay, so that is the flow. The last thing we need to talk about is effects. So in pro mixing, the way that you build in like reverb or delays is not to put a reverb or a delay on a track. You can, but you don't always need to do that because if you're gonna have the same kind of reverb or delay on several different tracks, then the better way to do that is actually to use what's called an effect send. And so there's a really cool way to do this built into GarageBand. If we just go to the bottom of our smart control window here, so I hit B to bring up our smart control window, you can see master echo and master reverb. And these are what's called an effect send. And so, this track is not actually, if I turn master reverb on here, I'm not putting reverb on this track. I'm sending this track to a master reverb reverb effect that is being blended back in to the entire mix. So if you look here, uh, each of these tracks has a master echo and master reverb, and it's all just one master echo or master reverb. So if I were to change the settings on this master echo, master reverb, it's gonna change it for all of them. So if you hit edit echo and reverb settings, if I were to change that here, it changes it for all of them. This is nice because it gives you one kind of cohesive sound that you can mix into, blend into. Now, uh, one limitation is that you only see master echo and master reverb on every single track. But then on a couple of tracks, you get maybe one more uh, type of sound here. So if we look at our audio track here, not just one, but two, you get an ambience and a reverb knob. And these are great additional reverb sounds that you can mix into. And so that is now giving us four effects sends. So we have a master echo, which is a delay, a master reverb, which is a reverb. And then over here we have an ambience and a reverb. So unfortunately, GarageBand doesn't give you every one of those tracks, those effects sends on every track. We, if you look here on this one, I don't see it. If you look here on this one, I think I do actually see it. Yeah, so it has a reverb knob over here that is likely going to the same one. Yeah, I believe it's going to the same one as this audio tracks reverb. If I go back to this audio track, so this reverb knob here is the same as this one on the organ. But again, if I change now that organ sound to a different synth sound or something, it might not be on there. And this drummer track doesn't have that same reverb knob. So unfortunately, it's a little bit limited in the effects sends department, but don't worry too much about that. You still have the two that you can use on any and all tracks. And then any audio tracks you use, you have these other two. So if I have a song with a bunch of vocals, for example, I could send all of those vocals to the ambience and reverb knobs over here since they're all gonna be audio recordings. Okay, so to quickly recap, we have our regions here that are gonna generate sound. If you're working with a software instrument or a drummer track, you'll also have a little plugin right here that's gonna generate that sound. You don't have to worry about that, but just know that. At that point, then it goes down through plugins. From the plugins, it goes to the volume fader right here, where you can turn it up or down in volume. Then the pan knob, where you can pan it off to one side or the other. And then it goes out through the master track, first through the master tracks plugins, and then through the master tracks volume and pan. 
And then finally, it goes through this master output up here. Okay, that is a signal path. Understanding that inside GarageBand will help you just to kind of take away some of the confusion when you're confused about why you can't hear something or why something's all of a sudden really loud. Understanding how the sound is moving around is really, really important. And you'll see as we get into mixing how we're using it to shape our sound. Okay, if you have any questions about signal flow inside GarageBand, let me know in the comments below. If you don't already have it, be sure to grab the ultimate GarageBand guide from the link in the description below. It's really gonna help you out. If this video was helpful, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you tomorrow with another video where we're gonna deep dive into the GarageBand amp. That's gonna be our last kind of overview of GarageBand because the amp is such a powerful tool. I wanna make sure you really understand it. See you tomorrow with another video. One thing at a time, I can only